Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to let me spend more time with interesting people than I would ever get on the radio. And this week's guest, Miles Jupp, star of stage and screen. Well, I've worked on both, certainly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know how brightly I shine, but I'm I'm often there. And and I mean, known for actually, to be fair, known to various different audiences for for various different things, from 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 CBBS through to Radio Four via a thick of it and sundry other and and of course as you're about to return to which we will work towards okay. in the course yeah, of the yeah. interview about to return to to stand up yeah it's a sort of patchwork quilt really of a career deliberately um, well no sometimes it's to do with a lack of planning and sometimes it's going oh that sounds fun or sometimes it's like gosh i need to do something that'd be great i was in a pub not long ago in kent with a friend and um i don't know how self-conscious you are in these situations but people on the next table were talking about me for I mean about 30 minutes <laughs> and um, they were trying to work out who I was and they narrowed me down to three possible contenders uh, all of whom I was they just didn't realize that they were the same person that's very gratifying it is no, yeah it's I, yeah the dots it's quite nice to leave the dots not joined up isn't it in that in that way but they were like no he's not he's the, he used to host that thing and the other one was saying no he was in that thing but I was like no they're all Anyway, a portfolio. I left, them, a port- I left them. I left them to it. A portfolio career. Um, we will start at the beginning in Newcastle, although you didn't spend very long there. I yeah, and the reason I didn't spend very long there is because I, I wasn't actually born there. Ah. That is a Wikipedia. I love it when thing. this happens. But I don't know who. But I, it's been like that for ages, and people tell me that all the time. But I've not. Have you ever been there? I've been there many, many times, <laughs> but I've not. Um, I think my grandfather was from Newcastle, my maternal grandfather. But I'm not. I don't. Somebody put that up there, and I don't. I'm, I don't mind enough to to change it. That that would be fine. That'd be no. that'd be exciting. A, I think. A friend of mine's been given a colostomy bag on Wikipedia that doesn't exist. In your... <laughs> Who is that? Is so that? I'm not telling you. I'll tell is you. That a journalist that's written. <laughs> this, this is, it's the thing that might happen to a critic. Like it uh, could be. Yeah. It could be that. <laughs> so so it, it actually says you were born in Newcastle, but spent most of your childhood in London. So it's sort of apologising for the mistake. Uh, right. Yes. But that's probably not true either. I, no, I did. I did. I did. I was born in London and I lived there until um, it's about 11 something like that your dad was a was a minister yeah United Reformed Church what does that mean for United that's Reformed a clergyman Church. United Reformed oh. Church is a kind of quite sort of um, chilled out congregationalism quite sort of progressive quite you know they um, you know they were uh, were uh, allowed to marry d- Divorced people could marry there from quite a long time and stuff. It's quite a, quite a sort of gentle, nice, nice bunch, I think. So that's. So I grew up in a in a manse, in um, in West Hampstead, and I'm afraid until I was about nine or ten, I genuinely thought that's what the whole world was like. Cozy. Um, yeah. Cozy. Very pleasant. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. I mean, f- quite. Um, yeah, sort of, sort of mad in a way. Yeah, we had sort of recognisable neighbours and things like that. But of course, we—I mean, it wasn't ours. We didn't. No. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's so how I lived there till I was about nine or ten. I, I how think. religious was was life? How religious was home? Um, well, it, the sort of pastoral aspect of it, a clergyman would spill over, and this is—I th- don't know if this—I don't know how the extent to which I carry this as baggage but people would come to the house in those days now I suppose I don't know if it's a data issue or just a general safety one mm. you know outside the church on the sign it would say oh the minister is Reverend Dr Peter Jupp and his address is and his number is so people could be sort of diverted very easily to the house I suppose and that's obviously sometimes that would be you know just members of the congregation but otherwise it would be people that needed help in in whatever yeah. way would come uh to the to the house and that thing i used to find you know i'd go out of the kitchen to the sort of hall and i'd suddenly realize oh there's someone there that it, it'd be like a stranger that i i sort of didn't know i mean generally it would be sort of fine but i think dad i think he got attacked once by someone really? that had come to the house and had been Gosh. let in before he was home and i remember as a gentleman that would sometimes come in the night and would need to be taken away in an ambulance and i'd Look out the window and see Dad in a dressing gown trying to persuade someone to get into. A, so not quite the, the sort of idyllic. No, but 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 that I'm I'm those are extreme. I, I mention those because they because they didn't happen every day. They yes. were just things that they okay. they they stood out because. Um, Did your dad talk to you about God and stuff much, or was that? A bit... Uh, no, not not. I mean, he'd uh, 
I suppose he'd answer questions that we had and stuff. He didn't uh, he didn't sit sit us down and say this is this is how it all happened. We'd go to church every Sunday. I won a regular attendance prize at Sunday school. That's a bit of a fix. Well, exactly. I remember <laughs> even as a child, with my of course this raging sense of justice for which I'm famed. I'm thinking it's not. I haven't really earned this because you know that this isn't that very little choice and free will has gone into this. But it was all perfectly enjoyable. Yeah. But I would see him preach. I suppose every every Sunday and that sort of thing. But it, no, it wasn't. It's not very sort of. Um, it's not very evangelical. It's not very fire and brimstone. Although we had a plate up in the house that I would, so I would walk past. It's a quotation I now realise in the book of Amos, mm. uh, as one came downstairs in the in the morning, um, sort of pass under it on the stairs. It, it just sort of plate with the words prepare to meet thy god on it <laughs> which is from the sort of one of the angrier bits of the old testament i mm. think so yeah so it was a uh, you know a presence and not present. not linked to to a school in the way that if he'd been a church of england vicar or something he could have he, he would have been the sort of well i did actually go to sort of anglican schools or but stuff but to which your dad had a connection no no that's no, what no, i no, mean I, so oh, you, weren't, yeah. you weren't so at school you, you you weren't defined by what your dad did no at but primary it, school it wasn't like that thing where people it was like a little slice of what it must be like for those people whose whose dad's the headmaster or whose yeah. mum's the headmistress but only for like an hour on a sunday like oh this is what it's be like yes. to be one of the people in the in the crowd who's who's related to the um the person up, you know in front you know that uh, that sort of thing that happens at, occasionally someone says mum or dad yeah, to a teacher yeah, or whatever yeah, and I yeah, suppose okay. it would be that, that um, kind of thing what were you like at primary school um, or what was primary school like I went to school near near there um, in Hampstead it was called the Hall School I think I must have gone there for about three three years um, i trying to think we, we had very indiscreet blazers very loud coloured blazers in fact, the blazers were pink, which is why I, in later I began my career. I was, you know, it seems second nature to be slipping on bright pink clothing and just sort of cracking on with life. Um, <laughs> and it, I don't, I'm, I remember being told off a, a lot, but also not reveling in that. Actually, I used to feel quite sort of mortified by being told off. And, what were you um, being told off for? Um, Exuberance. May, yeah, maybe exuber yeah exuberance with that that sort of not reading the room right kind of exuberance where you'd still be laughing at something when everybody else had stopped <laughs> and just sort of got on with it. Um, but I used to be quite, I would be quite mortified by it. But I, I'm, I do remember feeling quite sort of self conscious in that environment. I remember once playing uh, Jesus in something. You know, there'd be a sort of assembly play every Monday or Wednesday. And I, Around about Easter, I was playing Jesus in the sort of passion bit, and the I had to stand as if I was on the on the cross and give out the "Why hast thou forsaken me?" sort of cry, and I just couldn't do it loud enough. And I, the teacher spending a lot of time saying that honesty, put put yourself in his place. It was quite hard, <laughs> you know, quite quite a hard thing to do. You're about sort of six or seven, and you think, "Gosh, I don't know what it's like to be, um, you know, sentenced to death by the Romans." Right. Um, and I to a cross, and also I'd, I'd probably only read my lines, uh, <laughs> so maybe maybe the backstory hadn't really, you know, I wasn't um, hadn't really fully fleshed it out. But the the actual bit of going ah really loudly, I couldn't, I just couldn't bring myself to do. And then after some reason, my my parents I think were late picking me up, and I was left in the the sort of hallway you'd wait for them. And I thought oh, I should practice, I should do it as loud. as... And when the room was empty, I stood in the bit where I was meant to do the thing, and I did it really oh, loudly at the right volume. Gosh! And then when my mum and dad came, I went upstairs to say, oh, "It's all right, my parents are here." And it was the teacher, that and she said, "I could hear you practicing the cry again. That's that was that was that was the right volume." And I thought it was weird that she'd heard it, and she must have thought. She might have thought, oh, that's interesting. Or she might have thought, why didn't he do that this yeah. morning? I have no idea which which sort of style of direction she would have taken. But and I, nor can I explain why I'm remembering this particular incident now. But I remember being scared to make a really loud noise in front of everybody. So you weren't a show off then? I, no, I, I mean I did become one, but I'd, not not then. I was quite sort of um... it was shame. Probably. Do you were you remembering it? Because I remember things from when I was that age. With a with a, with that weird sense of shame when everyone is noticing you and you don't want to be noticed, so yeah, I guess there is an element of that. Yeah, you'd like to have choice, don't you? Yeah. When there's moments when you think, oh, and that's why, you know, I suppose actually getting into 
the world of sort of you know acting and entertainment or whatever there's a sort of control degree isn't it like, yes yeah. The, the bits I want them to say, notice me is when somebody says, please welcome, or, yes. you know, you come in or whatever, and there's a lighting change or whatever, and then it's all, it's, a, it's actually a much more controlled environment than people realise. So so it was a posh school, so you did you did the full run through from, from, from the Pink Blazard School to Prep School in Windsor, and then to Oakham School in Rutland. Mm-hmm. You, it was a, I mean, were you conscious of that? Were you conscious of privilege? Yeah. It's probably not so much in West Hampstead, I wouldn't have thought. Uh, I'm sure we were we were looked down on. Um, in uh, <laughs> I no, I do. I became increasingly conscious about it. At school, I suppose there was a bit more of a no. The prep school was very cosseted. I mean, it yeah. really. Did you board there? Yeah, from seven then or nine. Nine. That's we, quite young, isn't it? It is young, and actually, I don't know what we'd seen a documentary, a film, something set at a boarding school. If. <laughs> God, that's a niche and, joke. And we went, yeah, and we went. That's what we want to do. I would really like, yeah, to put all those guns to use. Uh, I'd like some of me to be inexplicably shot in black and white for reasons that you think are arty, but turn out to be entirely budgetary. Yes. No, it was not. It was. It would have been something that put a more positive spin on life right. at a boarding okay. school. Okay. Uh, it's a, we used to watch that a lot, though, when we were teenagers. My brother and I, we watched If again and again and Same. again. Is it is it Cheltenham? It's filmed it or something. Fil- like? Yeah, it was Lindsay Anderson's old school, Cheltenham. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. They let him back without being fully clear about what it was. Yeah, he was planning yeah. To I do. think my mum knew someone had been there or was involved with the school and something. They really did not know what they were letting themselves. No, they really didn't. In for um, we'd seen something that must have sort of cast these sorts of schools in a mm. positive light, and then became obsessed with the idea that you know, or maybe it was like a Jennings and Derbyshire novel mm, or something. You mm, know, but just mm. oh, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. And then my father was finishing work in that church, was going to do a PhD, and they obviously decided that this they'd listen to us. Um, <laughs> then we were in a car journey somewhere, and we brought up our constant, when are we going to go to... And they said, well, actually, um, you know, that's you, you are going to. And, of course, we both burst into tears. And I'm oh. like, how dare you? This is out. And they were going, oh, my God. But I, so you're close in age, are you? And your he's three, uh, just under three years older than me. Okay, yeah. but you were tight. You were very tight by the sounds of it. Well, we were, particularly when we went to, when we went away, actually. We yes. got, you know, like all young children, we used to sort of scrabble a lot. We were very tight now, and we became very tight oh, then. Nice. So my parents, they were nice. <laughs> they were listening to us. And, they went, and then we went completely ape about it. And they were, and they were going, oh, sorry, but you... <laughs> Now what, what you want. Now what happens? Yeah. So, um, but they have listened to us since. They've been kind enough to, uh, you know, not they're not there. Right. We must never listen to any of their suggestions to go. We must <laughs> almost do the opposite of what they want. But yeah. But I was a, I, although a, a, a boarded, we, we lived close to where we boarded. So right. at, at Windsor, I was weekly. Yes. And I'd go home every weekend until I got to a point when I you kind of think, actually, it'd be more fun to be sort of hanging around with my, yeah, pals or whatever. And then, and again, my parents, by that point, we'd moved and we lived very near. So I went home a lot during term time and you could always, always, all right, if I nip home on Wednesday or whatever, it was pretty. Best of both worlds, in a way? Or um, were, were you tr- I mean, you seem to have had a fairly easy time, a nice time of it. Or Yeah. Well, it's an era where a lot of really bad stuff was happening in boarding schools, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, but even now you look back and you, 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 you know the laws will be changed or yes of or, course or whatever yeah. and uh would you, you, haven't, you wouldn't send yours any of yours to boarding no. school no 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 Why not? no have i well, i just don't think it's necessary no i think it's um it's weird isn't it but it's completely it is, normal when it you're is in it. weird but when you're in it it's normal and that yes. and that's sort of that it's sort of, that's the way you sort of learn about coping yeah. mechanisms and stuff isn't it you don't yeah question the thing and then i remember being so ed came up to stay with me when i was I was at Edinburgh and I was doing a festival one year and he um and we suddenly were like talking about we could remember the fact that at the age of well I would have been nine or ten mm. you know you'd be fully timetabled from something like seven fifteen even when your bath was yes, or exactly, two weekly yes, yeah. baths on a rotation yeah and we realised and we could still remember our timetable from the from like seven fifteen in the morning until whenever bedtime was you know, this is years later and then you suddenly think. Well, that was weird, wasn't it? Yeah. But it took a while for that sort of drip. Yeah, the kind of drip, drip of realization. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I see. And I kind of say, so, yeah, no, my my children go to go to school where we where we live. What were you good at? What did you did you did you excel at anything when you got to St George's? 
Um, I didn't really excel at things. I I don't I don't know if I'd sort of developed any of my. I became interested in cricket. We don't have to talk about cricket, but I became interested in it. It's the first thing I remember be being passionate about something. Mm. Um, and I became very interested in it, but I wasn't. It was a very small school, and I, you know, it was barely good enough to get into the, the teams. It was such a small school that sometimes I would play for the school in sports that I didn't play, if you know right, what I mean. Yes. Yeah, like I chose, make up I, the number. I chose hockey one term, so on Tuesday and Thursday I would practice hockey, but on Saturday I would play rugby for the first 15, despite not having played rugby since the last, you know, the week before when we'd have been <laughs> hammered sort of 87 2 by, by somebody else. You were that school, were you? Um, but I, yeah, yeah. Um, I, but I, and I didn't, I wasn't really interested in plays and stuff. We'd always be in them and I, they, they'd be quite fun, but I didn't, I wasn't. So there's not a moment where you're standing on a stage thinking, this is what I want to do with the rest of not, my life. Not then. Well, no. No. Um, la yeah, later, I, 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 some friends of mine, one was in the band and one was doing props or something on a school musical when we were about 14. And the guy is a really brilliant um, musician. Mm. And he he was saying, oh, he just kept every day. He'd be like, oh, this happened yesterday when we rehearsed. He just kept telling me stories about it. It just sounded really fun. And he said, oh, well, well, Dan, go and ask if you can. So I went and asked if I could be like a stagehand as well. Mm. And just completely lo loved it. Right? It was really fun. I found it really exciting when the show was happening. And I, you know, it was just the job to put various things in places when curtains were down or behind the set. But what I did get to do, so a um, girl called Leah was, she was the inside the, um, it was Little Shop of Horrors. Yes. So she was the, the plant. Uh, and um, not the voice of the plant, she was all the plants moving. But during the curtain call, she and a uh, guy, actor, Matt Baldwin, who was doing the voice, they, they came out and took their bow with T-shirts on. One said voice, one said, I don't know what hers would have said, movement or whatever. Yeah. And then during the, they, would, they would then point to the thing. So for that five seconds each night during the curtain call, I would be inside the, the big plant thing, sort of moving it and doing about. <laughs> and honestly, I just loved it. And no one, <laughs> it was about four or five seconds. No yeah. one could see me. I couldn't see them. I just knew there was a sort of some, there would be some sort of cue I would get. And I thought, oh, right, next time there's a play, I'm going to try and get in it, an audition for it and whatever. Um, and so that bizarrely, that was a moment when I, I realised I really liked it, despite the fact I could not see the audience. They, maybe that's sort of why I've done so much radio. Uh, just a total sort of obliviousness <laughs> on all sides, but just an awareness that there must be something there. And yet, a weird thing, a few, many years later, at the Edinburgh Festival, that some people did a, they were on a gig, I can't remember the name of it, but the point was that it was conducted in total darkness. Mm. And you'd be doing, I think you'd come on, you'd be, I can't remember even if it was compared, but you would be announced and you'd come on in the, the light and then it would go dark and then you'd begin your set. And uh, people said, you're going to do it. Sort of, you know, mm. Edinburgh, you're doing so many gigs, you get to the point when you're going, I'll, I'll just do something because it's interesting or mm. whatever. That. And I I went and did it and I, different people said, oh, I found I'd started doing this or I became very relaxed or I became very tense not being able to see oh. them or what. I, um, when it went dark, I began my set and I realised after all, no one can see me so rather than standing at the front, sort of banging it out, selling it, I thought, I've, you know, the microphone is pretty much on my lip when I'm doing stand-up. And actually what I did when it was dark, I turned my back on the audience, walked off to where I knew the, like the corner was, because it was the venue I was doing my show as well, and just leant against it, doing my set with my back to the audience as far away from them as I could be in that space, essentially. And then when I knew the time was nearly 20 minutes, I made sure I was back in mm. back at the front. So when the lights came up, I was back at the front. But my, I don't know what the how it would be analysed, but that was my the, that to me it was like, oh, I can do that. I don't need to be, I don't need to be front and centre in this environment. I can literally go and <laughs> lean lean against the back cloth in the dark. That's fascinating. Yeah, also quite weird, and I think yeah. in retrospect quite disrespectful. Do you? To the audience. Well, the lights aren't on. I don't know. If no, it's disrespectful. but I feel at the same time. But maybe that meant I. Maybe that was the position in which I felt I would be most comfortable. Or yeah. maybe you're just, you know, when you, when you've got material in your head that you're doing lots, you can almost there's that sort of, and sometimes it's a useful way of overcoming nerves mm. or autopilot, but sometimes it's, it is just just laziness, and I don't know which of those <laughs> which of those two it was.
Is that, did, well, Maybe it's just laziness is an answer I find myself because <laughs> the option to most the answer to most things you could be asked. Yeah, maybe it was just, could just maybe it could just be like, why hasn't this happened? Well, it was because it awfully busy the door. No, it is just laziness. Yeah, yeah. But you don't, I mean, even there, you're sort of not displaying the look, I mean, literally not displaying the look at me gene that many would expect performers to have. Now, well, no, that 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 story. Oh, in that story, yeah, the lights aren't. Well, on, I suppose I've opted to go and do a gig where they definitely won't be able to see yes. you because you know the dark. Yeah. But when did the look at me, Gene, emerge? I wonder when you were operating the plant whether there was a very rousing cheer. Maybe but just one cheer, the yeah, because it would be, wouldn't it? It'd be a different cheer from what everybody can't, else can't got. start a fire without a spark, as the well, great yes. philosopher said. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there must have been. So I tell you what, though. I, so I, I did a, a play at school. I would. Maybe the sort of formal plays in which I would play. I played Second Lord in a lot of Shakespeare plays. Mm. We'd have maybe one speech or whatever. It's not great, but still. My Lord. Well, it's. Yes. My it's, Liege. My Lord. Yeah, that's just from yeah. my Lord, the Rhenish clown at whom so often Grace was going to laugh. He's also missing. But I, in what we did, I sort of had like a house play, which would be a bit more informal. And we obviously, I seem to remember the scripts hadn't arrived for quite, you know, and, and it hadn't been. Anyway, we just weren't ready, and we sort of bust our way through it and <laughs> messed around and improvised and broke the fourth wall and all these sorts of things. And actually, that was that was really that was just really funny. And as in, like in the next day, people were like, "We were there. That was bonkers. That was uh, you know thrilling." Then, and that was a little bit of it. That was a bit of excitement. And people that had previously not not been rude to me, not been sure. nasty, maybe not not really spoken to, suddenly were like, "Oh, hi." you were in that thing you know and I guess maybe there was a little bit about that but also that bit I can sort of remember but I can act, but I can really remember what it felt like being on stage yeah. doing something ad-libbing something that not that you didn't specifically ask not to do but you certainly haven't been told to do and whatever and and and, and it was quite an infectious it, it was very exciting and uh, in that environment I suppose it's sort of controlled naughtiness yes isn't it you know it's the, yes it is um, but that, yeah, that was pretty. It was a play called "The Best Days of Our Lives," which is a sort of. I think it's set in a school that's being, uh, you know, it's during evacuation or whatever, and a, oh, yeah. it's a boys' school and a girls' school is evacuated to their school or whatever, and it's just. I, I can't remember anything. I can't. I might. I don't know. If at the time, I knew what was going on any more than I do now. <laughs> but we sort of bust our way, bust our way through it. And yeah. you discovered something. And though, I thought even that was you probably didn't realise it at the time. You found something. Well, that I think I'd probably already spent quite a lot of time messing about and trying to be amusing. I had a friend at the school I was at in Windsor, who's still my friend, mm. and his mum is an actor, and he'd said to me once, oh, "I think you're you're funny," and I hadn't really. <laughs> or he said to some other people, I think he's funny, and I hadn't really sort of thought about it. Again, I, until I like cricket, I really don't know what I thought about. Um, but he, um, and then so I, and then you're aware of it, and then so I would make, and I think in retrospect, some of it was, I don't know if I was wasting my time because it it's been ultimately useful, but yeah. I was definitely wasting other people's <laughs> trying to be funny. Yeah, yeah. I had this great this history teacher was really nice at school, but I used to make a lot of silly remarks and stuff, and one day. I realised he, he was talking, but he was sort of looking at me in a slightly quizzical way. And I, after all, and I sorry, said, sorry, why are you looking at me like that? And he said, um, <laughs> I'm literally, I'm just wondering what it is that you're about to say that's going to make me look stupid. Gosh. And he was sort of trying to second guess me. And it wasn't said in a sort of malicious put me down way. He literally was, he was just answering the question. He said, the reason I'm looking is I'm, yeah. although I'm talking about this, I'm genuinely trying to, I'm just trying to guess what it is you're yeah. about to say. And I didn't even know if I was thinking about anything, but it was quite... At the time, I thought, oh, that's quite... Yeah. Whereas now I think, yeah. oh, that must have been really annoying to have that sort of at the back of Because yeah. I just want to... You know, you need to learn about the, like, whatever it would have been, about what a, war of what a prior here. was. Or, you know. um, we, what were you like academically then? I, um, I was... And it took me a long time to learn. I was a sort of student who, if I didn't do much, put much work in... I could sort of get like a B and ever put in a load more work, like a load more work, I could get a B plus. Hmm. And so consequently, I didn't put the, <laughs> so the work in that would yeah. make, and every now and then, every now and then you sort of work hard. And, but I, you know, I sort of got a bit more sort of fed up and grumpy as I suppose people do in their teens, whatever. And I, I sort of didn't really, I didn't really feel 
kind of encouraged or whatever and there was a time when I you know all I was interested in was was like cricket which I wasn't at all good but I liked and and being in the school plays and I was like oh no you can't do both A level is very important you've got to choose Mm. one Mm. or or whatever and I remember the teacher at school would say what what do you want to do and I'd be like well I want to do you know I want to do the sort of thing that Fry and Laurie do you develop that much of of an ambition then yeah yeah and I would buy tapes I'd watch right any comedy that was on TV and I'd buy tapes of it and, and listen to it and, and stuff and I said that's what I'd like to and he went yeah but you can't you know that's not a plan you can't do that and I was like, mm. you know and I'd sort of feel slightly miffed by that at the time but I'd probably use that as mm. you know some sort but of um, motivation it wasn't regarded as a proper ambition even though it was your ambition then I guess so it's not it's not um but you knew people. You've already alluded to a couple of people who were were actors, or your friend's mum was an actor, so you knew yeah. that world existed. Yeah, you? I knew. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, but I didn't know. I suppose Matthew McFadgen. Yeah, he's a few years older than me, but he'd been at my school, so he, I think he might have overlapped with my brother, maybe. Yeah. So there'd be a kind of, well, look. I mean, you know, that's yeah. a that's a real job, you know. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't know, but whatever. But also, the thing is, I was perhaps, I, you know, perhaps I wasn't working as hard as I was supposed to be working, and mm. perhaps I would be told these things are distractions and, and deny it, and it. they probably were. I mean, I can't. It'd be mad to come and say I was right about everything, and they were wrong all this time. The frustrating. Like everything, Look at there's me now. probably a sort of balance to yes. it. And I probably could have worked. It's probably just laziness, James. Probably just laziness. Kind of probably miles. just laziness. How, how would you have turned the cricket enthusiasm into a career then? Or was that uh, when we were a journalist, a cricket writer? Well, I, I mean, I, no, I mean, the dream would have been to be, able, to be able to do course, it. A sort of adventure in cricket Adventure journalism. in cricket journalism, yeah. <laughs> Fibber in the Heat was about pretending to be a cricket journalist. In, <laughs> to um, be Scotland, BBC Scotland's cricket correspondent. The BBC Scotland cricket correspondent. I think a, a still unfilled role. A still, <laughs> yeah, and, and it had never been advertised, in fairness to them. Um, yes, I did. Well, I, I've got, I'd love to have been able to play, but, mm. you know, I just, just wasn't... Not only was I not very good, it took me quite a while to realise I wasn't sort of very oh, okay. good. And I'd, you know, I'd sort of do the maths in my head when I was about twelve or something. Oh, I can't get into the first eleven. Ah, but then it's possible that not everyone that is in the first eleven will ultimately want to go on and do this for a career. So maybe spaces will open up. Of course, I'm I'm only thinking in a very small parochial way, not thinking <laughs> there's thousands of people across the country that are so complete fantasy, fantasy really. Um, Sweet. But yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> very silly. But I did. Yeah, I got. I tried so 2006. Yeah, I went to India pretending to be the um, the BBC Scotland cricket correspondent, <laughs> and it went. And I got. And I thought. What, I thought the difficult bit would be sort of getting into the press box. Uh, to me, that was kind of the quest, mm. and the quest was achieved relatively easily. It's then you're inside, and people go, "What are you doing here?" Yeah, and he's like. I don't know because I don't know what happens in here essentially is like, the thing like the and dog I, who know, caught the squirrel it's like yeah. what, do, what do you do now you know in in Frasier that episode where they discover there's a higher membership they, there's a sort of gym and yes, sauna they, they're a member yeah, of and they yeah. keep and they do, oh that's fantastic we finally achieved gold card and then someone's like I'm just um, have you guys seen the platinum or whatever it is and they keep <laughs> and finally there is a door they discover and it's like I can't believe it and they get it and they go through it and they're in the alley with the bins it there was, was sort a, of that yeah there was a club when I was at University in London uh, on uh, Great Queens. It was called Browns, and it had VIP. It was exactly like that. And, I, and so there were three or four different levels of VIP as you went up this townhouse. Yeah. And and I think in the top it was basically Michael Hutchins sitting in a cupboard on his, <laughs> on, on his own. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like that. That kind of there's always someone extraordinary. The, yes, a fire, the, fire escape. It's the actually, echelon yes. above you. So so, but you did A levels. So you had an so. Were you just sort of, you have to go to university. It's a conveyor belt thing, that's really. The, that's the for, route. For yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can, I can sort of see that for the figures. That's useful, isn't it? Mm. And I, but I'm really glad I did go. I mean, I went. I had to go and do. I had to retake one of my A levels. Um, Probably just laziness. <laughs> almost certainly. Almost certainly. <laughs> I was, I was sort of ill during them, but okay. no, it was laziness. I've, I, I had to. This is found very old fashioned, but my school had a. If you were ill, you went to the sanatorium. Yes, yeah, we had one. And um, where were you? Where were you? Scrampleford. Right, right. Oh, yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. That's that's got a rather longer controversy section on its Wikipedia page than my school. Probably. <laughs> um, that's just a, yes. Look, it's a test case, of course. Yes. Um, the um, the 
they, you go to the sanatorium to do your exams. And so I sat some of my exams in the sanatorium, which was a sort of, seems in retrospect, kind of unattended building. Yeah. And I, I got up to go to the loo in one of my exams. And I was in the cubicle. And, the, and I, I don't know how, maybe like leaning over at the paper or something, it wasn't really bolted to the floor. And it, it slid off. And I became wedged between... <laughs> the loo slid one way and I went the other. And I became wedged between the loo and the, and the wall. And I... I was just like I just couldn't work out sort of how to get you know it's quite a confined space mm. and I you know not got into the position I was in deliberately and I couldn't and I sort of called for help for about fifty minutes and eventually I must have, I don't know I found an angle or whatever worked out how I could sort of get out of this ridiculous you know incredibly undignified position and you know, cleaned up everything as best as I could <laughs> um, and um, I went back into the room where it was just my exam I was sat doing it about ten minutes later someone opened the door and said you shouting I said no no and just carried on but yeah I guess I, I was shouting yeah. um, but no it, it was just laziness but I went to Edinburgh University and I had yeah great I mean just really fun I met loads of people um, did lots I started doing stand up when I was in first year at a comedy club in the but would that have been? Would, I mean, that that didn't happen by accident. That was you got there and you thought, no, "Where no. can I go and do?" So and by even now the, you're even the people who say it happens by accident, it, it didn't it happen, can't by, happen no. by accident. Well, can't well I just really. found my, the next thing I knew. Mm. So, um, so there's resolve here. Then there is, there is, there is a sort of more formalized ambition emerging. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. But there's there's also a sort of nervous layer. So I mm. I started doing stand up in March, two thousand. But but I'd heard that, that there was a. A workshop you could do if you went to this this stand on a Sunday if you wanted to sort of have a good stand there was a big beginners workshop mm. and someone had told me about that so I thought well I would like to do that so that's what I'll, I'll do and so about three or four months previously I'd gone down on the Sunday to when I knew that these workshops started and there was a few sort of people sitting around nervously but there was another show had finished or whatever and someone came in and said um, okay everyone that's here for the workshop come through now and I'm Oh no 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 no! And I and they said, "Are you here for the workshop?" And I said, "No no no!" And I left. <laughs> and then so then I was ah oh. so I you know I, three months later I was like, "No, this time I must do it." So All I think right. then I told people that I was going to do it because as a kind of yeah 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 then you yeah. then you then you kind of got to haven't you? So no that that is that that is what I wanted wanted to do, and it was fun, and it, but it was also suddenly already I'd only just arrived at university. It was it was kind of playing with the grown ups by this point, and there was a yeah, different okay. world out there and. It wasn't like a load of other people who were 20. It was, you know, people that had been divorced or come out or, uh, you know, got clean or whatever it might be. Just you're like, there's a whole world out here. And, you you know, and I would go and do gigs all around Scotland and I'd go and do, you know, gigs in pubs in Glasgow and stuff like that. So it like kicked that. off quite quickly. You got you got momentum behind you. And, yeah, and yeah. And probably quite a lot of opportunities there. If you were in... There were, but also I, I really felt encouraged. The other, the other people mm. that did it and the people who ran the clubs... Were, were genuinely really encouraging and, and you would you know would, would ring up and say can you do this or will you come and do an open spot we've got this gig this week do you want to do it and I so I you know it was it was really exciting suddenly and the very thing I was being told could you perhaps try doing less of that two or three years earlier yes. people were ringing and saying there <laughs> were also more. <laughs> other grown ups were saying do this and you're like oh I see right I didn't realise it didn't occur to me there was more than one way of you know things, um, things what, working what was your act Miles what was your what was your early act my early act was um I so in the, at the workshop, uh, different people would take it each week, and you get up and you do five minutes. And I, my very first thing, I can't. I think I had a thing about a, what it would be like trying to walk a a dog that had actually already been stuffed or whatever, and you'd have to get the lead. It would have to be a sort of solid object or whatever. But I can't remember what what that came from. And I had some sort of bits of wordplay and, and stuff. But the the lady who was taking the workshop one week, a guy had got up before me from Leeds and another guy from Huddersfield, and they'd done their sets, and they were very funny. And, and they, after them, she said, at this point, I would just say something to consider, you two, uh, both of you for stand-up, you've got quite posh accents, and I think that's something that you... Uh, it's, it's great what you're doing, but I think, I think that's something you do need to address. Mm. And I was still sitting in the corner, I hadn't got up yet, and I thought... Oh crikey! So while the next act was on, I sort of came up with something that sort of addressed it instantly, and um, it was this thing about being someone calling me a posh twat in the street, and me thinking, "How did they know?" And then I realised that the um, one of them 
gentleman in my entourage had uh, hit this man in the face with his wax jacket whilst chewing him out of my way and uh, and then it turns out I'm on a sedan chair or whatever and it was just a sort of thing that built and it was a kind of obviously you come out there and it sounds like this sort of, but it's actually a piece of yes. you know self defense and so then I that became sort of my shtick a bit and I was inspired by some other people as well you know go down sort of that 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 sort of route and so I did yeah, then you end up, you, you become a character act, really. And then I sort of peeled, well, I just stopped doing that. I had a point when I was doing that sort of posh stand up thing, and then you'd be like, you know, you might be doing the late gig or somewhere at a club, and you walk to the, you know, you're on the tube coming home from a gig, and you're the, yeah. you know, I don't want to bring a costume in a bag. So you suddenly think, oh, it's sort of half 11 at night, everyone else on the tube's drunk, and I'm, I'm in sort of brogues and corduroys and a pair of tweed jacket, and this isn't. I I dress like this because for a, for a thing, and I you'll think that I am this thing, and and uh, and so I thought there must be another way of doing it. So you 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 you, you evolve into your own skin then as a stand-up. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But also, if you start that young, so I was twenty. You don't really know, or I didn't know anything. Really, I'd had a very no, cosseted sure. up man. I didn't know. I didn't know what was appropriate, what was inappropriate. I didn't know what was in terms of subject matter. The One of the good things about Scotland, when I saw it, was everyone, I'd go to a night and everybody would be doing something different. So I thought, right, the thing you need to do is do something different. Whereas okay. perhaps on another yeah. circuit, going, everyone does jokes about this and that, so that's what I need to do. But I it was very sort of un, unworldly, and in terms of sort of topic or opinion or whatever, I didn't really know what I was doing. But, and so that takes a long time time you're sort of you're evol you're developing but you are doing everything in front of people or whatever and you know but the the other thing is that from a confidence point of view i wouldn't be able to start now right at 20 you're like you've still got enough of the yeah. i suppose the armor or in my case the armor that i'd sort of put on at boarding school or whatever that's not all come off so you're like yeah i can do that and I, yeah that's fine why why wouldn't the people in this pub basement on socky hall street be interested in 20 minutes of jokes from me a 20 yeah. year old theology undergraduate they're going to be up for this or whatever so you've got just enough of that confidence before that's so, been yeah. finally sort of turned turned to dust um so i i so that was a good reason to that was a good thing about being young but it, yeah it took a while to sort of find your own skin and even now obviously you're, you there's modes you sort of slip into and of course and the and the posh thing you, you know the posh thing i suppose one slips into when you actually really can't think of something else to say about mm. something so mm. you, it's a little bit of a kind of I haven't, I haven't been doing it until now I've been doing stand-up phrases or whatever but if you're on a panel show and you couldn't think of anything or whatever then you know it's just laziness James but one would go <laughs> oh I've absolutely it I'm not it's just, it wasn't covered in the papers I read uh, or, wh or whatever it is and you've not you've, you've said you've said something funny but you've not really engaged with the uh, point Gosh, and you're just you yeah. know it's yeah. No, I understand. I'm going to stop saying the it's just laziness thing because, you know, I'm no, of course, if you throw enough not, mud, you're you quite hard mud. working and you're working. I mean, then we'll get to the new show shortly, which obviously is it, it, it does involve graft putting together a big stand up show. But the, I'm interested in the point at which you, you, you kind of genuinely then thought, yes, career rather than I mean, rather than hoped you yeah. believed. Quite well, quickly, I sense in the, during this period, because then of course the the telly comes knocking while you're still at university. Yeah, we we did a show called Live Floor Show on BBC Scotland, um, and I'd done. Yeah, it was a sort of gang show about five of us, and I did that, and I was in, I would have been in third year at university then, and uh, it was a four year degree, mm. and then while I was doing that I think and we did one series of that so like eight episodes and then so someone I bumped into on the train said oh my husband someone I knew she was a stand up poet oh my husband's producing a kid's show and was wondering if you'd audition and I said oh, okay yeah, I'll, you know, and I knew I, I knew him and I, was like, and I thought oh this must be how it works yeah you do one thing and then another yeah. thing comes along and so I auditioned for that so that was Balamori and then I, I I suppose I was saying oh these things don't happen back but that maybe you're like well, I wonder what this will be like, and I so I had I did have an agent by then. I'd won a a newcomer competition called So You Think You're Funny in um, two thousand and one, two thousand one. The Leicester Mercury. Community. I also won the Leicester Mercury Community in the same yeah, year. Yeah. 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 A... When I won the Leicester Mercury Community of the Year, James, I <laughs> had only gigged in Scotland, maybe one gig in Newcastle, and I'd not been gigging that long. You know, less than, it was only open to people been going less than a year, and my whole act about sort of being. The sort of posh English person yeah. had been developed entirely for its Scottish audience okay. and I so I got the train down to Leicester and I thought I wonder if this is funny here gosh 
and I, I didn't, I'd, I didn't, hadn't really thought about going beyond the sort of confines I was in. As you know, it went made our way down the East Coast Main Line. I thought, mm. I assume I'm getting less and less funny with each passing. <laughs> with every station. Yeah, yeah. You know, and someone would get on at Newcastle, and I'd say something, it wouldn't be that funny. And I was like, oh, they like that in Berwick. What's going on here? You know, and uh, you know, by the time you get to Peterborough, you're like, you're really unfunny, and now you're sort of just turning straight off to Leicester, and it's all. But I. Um, so we did that that TV show, and then and, and then the, I got the Balamori thing. And I, but I was still at university, and I remember going to my director of studies and saying, um, "I've been offered a part in this thing, and um, uh, but it's twenty two weeks mm. of filming, and it will clash with whatever like the first set sure. of finals and stuff like that." Um, and this is how institutionalized mm. I was. I said to him, and he said, "So what's the?" Um, yeah, that sounds. You know, I said to him, a "Am I allowed to do it?" And he said, "Well, yeah, you can do." You'd be twenty-two about this point, would you? Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm, "Yeah, I'm a grown-up, <laughs> but only you know." And he he said, yeah, "Of course, you you know you can do whatever you like." Yeah, this sounds like a really good opportunity. Yeah, I mean, you can come come back to this when you. Whereas I'm, I didn't, I didn't think. I didn't think that's how it. Well, there's <laughs> well, it two. Works. There's a duality as well, perhaps. There is the sort of the 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 world you wanted to be in and the world you were in, and now they are sort of clashing, aren't they? For yeah, the first time. I guess. And he was going, "Yeah, that sounds really fun." I mean, <laughs> well yeah, done. just go well do done. it. Great. Yeah, great. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh, it turns out." Whereas I thought I was having to go and sort of persuade him. Yes. Well, and I, my age had gone. Yeah, just do it because it's, you know, and I mean. By that age, some people would have been to or been through drama school or, or mm. whatever. And he said, this would be your kind of training, if you if you like. And I didn't really think... And, it, and all the other thing he said was, look, it's a very new channel, CBBS. Not many people watch it. It's just, a, you know, nobody will see it. Probably just go and do it and enjoy it. So I, I, I went off and... And it and it and then it became obviously of its of its type and time a sort of big it was huge. program. So that was, was the sort huge. of that that's the bit when you think, gosh, this isn't something that I'm in control of really. And, um, and you're in it for a long time as well, or, or did they just repeat it so often that it seemed like it was on? Oh uh, no, no, we did. We filmed did the twenty two. Did twenty two weeks in two thousand and two. Yeah, and then two thousand and four we did thirty weeks. Okay, and that, and that was all we it's did. A, quite a large body of work. It is a lot. Yeah. Well, I, and I'm in about all of us are in half the episodes, apart yeah, from yeah. Julie, who plays the main teacher. So she'd be on all of them. But yeah, you'd film eight episodes a week, and it was it was a sort of in retrospect, you, although you know you'd film twenty five pages a day or whatever. Mm. So it was very there was a lot of it. And I lived in Edinburgh, and I would get the train through to Glasgow, and I'd be, you know, I was still twenty two, and you sort of think you know pubs close at one o'clock in Edinburgh, yeah, or did yeah. did then, and you'd be like, oh gosh, right, well I'm tomorrow, I must make sure I'm at the train station for half past six because I got to go in the end. You, we were able to cope with that sort of yeah. schedule, but also you learnt about. I didn't know what any of the language meant. I didn't know what what you know. And looking back, you're like, oh, I see. I understand the rhythms of the filming day, and you know what people's jobs are, and why certain parts of the day are stressful to some people on a crew, and certain parts for for others. Um, you know the importance of not letting people down when I was first there I had a fantastic lesson from a I think she was a producer and I turned up one day really hung over and I we'd film in this studio not much bigger than this it was an old breakfast news studio and it, it was hot mm. and uh, depending on whether or not it was a, a rainy day in Balamori or a windy day or whatever sometimes my character would be in you know like a fleece yes. and a scarf and a tam or whatever you I, I mean my goodness it was hot and I so I'd turn up with this sort of raging hangover, and I, um, <laughs> I just, and I wasn't sort of quiet about it or whatever. And we'd do a take, you know, I'd do it, you know, when the things went, you're like, oh, hello, you do come in, yes. Oh, I've had a fantastic day. We've eaten a biscuit or whatever the, you know, the um, dialogue would have been. And um, and then when they go cut, I'd go, oh. <laughs> <sighs> and uh, after about an hour of this, one of the producers came and said, look, turn up here as hungover as you like. Just don't tell people. <laughs> Say I said, advice. "Oh right, I thought I was trying to make excuses." It's fine, you, you know. You can do your job fine, but if every time they sound cut, you go oh and collapse heavily and into an armchair, you bring the entire room down. And so, I thought oh, that's really useful. One, obviously, it's something I needed to be told. Mm. It didn't occur to me about the sort of, you know, that being a team is really one of my favourite things. But it didn't occur to me about the impact that was having on other people. I thought 
I thought it was just my own hell, uh, and I didn't realise how infectious how infectious it was. Um, and so, yeah, now I just don't tell people. Um, so this was your job. This is where you've got an enormous I hangover. I yeah, you bounce in, going really jolly for like ten minutes. People go, "You're in a good mood today," and you go, "Oh, I can't tell you why." <laughs> and then they forget. Yeah. So this was your drama school then, really. This was, did you finish your degree? Yeah, I went you back did. in you 2005. Did, I finished did do the degree, it, yeah. and and uh, I mean, it's an odd introduction to fame for you presumably you, you did have people recognizing you yeah i suppose like your face or whatever they wouldn't really know your name necessarily no, no. but apart from doing well, but then if you, you did other, archie, then, then he did other stuff yeah yes. yeah it was a bit sort of un. and was it a nice gradient now or did did, did but you... it also it also sort of stopped again there was a point where mm. remember with rachel my, my wife when we were going out in edinburgh there was a point where you know i remember once we'd gone to like some Scottish teenagers realised that Archie was on the Dodgems. It was not not a relaxing seven minutes, and um, and I, you know, I no. gave as good as I got. And um, you know, we'd have a situation like that sometimes, which is actually completely un. In that sort of situation, that's sort of fine. And, and like actually, you, I don't know, you being in a pub or whatever, they'd be mm. like, "Oh, that's you know, that's all fine or whatever." And then some, we went, but occasionally you'd be like, "Oh, let's not go in there. It looks a bit busy or, or yeah. whatever." And then we walk through some gallery full of people that would have been that demographic and 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 Rachel's like oh, it must just not be on anymore no one right it's, yeah. just, it's just gone again yeah um so but it yeah that's slightly sort of it was sometimes slightly feverish and that sort of control if I could you yeah, know I can't be yeah, ungracious yeah, yeah. about it because it it, it, it um you know it was very it was a launch la- yeah and it was good to me and you know it was sort of financial and it but it meant oh, I do this and so I you know I could it meant that I could turn up and, you know, I would pay my tuition fees or, or whatever yeah, and, yeah, and not the grant and that and that sort of thing. So, yeah, but it was an odd, I don't know, maybe that's exactly what RADA's like, I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> do, they, do they launch their colouring books at, they, they, uh, at ice rinks? They, I know they, we did. Did you do uh, that? <laughs> they did fantastic. I think at the Brayhead Arena we launched a series of colouring colouring books. We turned on the lights at St Enoch's Shopping Centre. All the greats. And at Aberdeen, Aberdeen we did. We turned on the lights. So they were, I mean, they were heady, heady days. We genuinely did two weeks at the Hammersmith Apollo. Of course, yeah. Um, did you, the I don't know if you were there. Show. Gordon Brown saw it. Did you not see it? No, I missed that. But oh, although my, my children loved it, if they'd known it was on, they probably would have wanted to go. What happened after then? Did Because the, this is the bit I'm not fully clear about, and then we'll then we'll skip through all the bits that people know and arrive at... Is, this is the bit of, like, like Dominic Cummings' his Russia years. Yes, no, What's it's not the Russia there? years. There's an even better bit about oh, Dominic that? Cummings, which is after... Um, after he worked on the referendum for devolution in the North East when John Prescott wanted to open mm. regional parliaments. Yeah. And he was involved in that and they won. And and then the line in the, the almost the official biography is that he went to the... His father had just bought a farm in County Durham and he went there and they built a bunker together and he moved into the bunker for two years to read history and science books in the hope of understanding the world. Oh, wow, wow. That's Cummings' origin yeah, story. Yeah, it is his origin story. But what happened now, c- career-wise? Did you yeah, were you on a gentle sort of... gradient, or, or did you did you have a hiatus? So, so, so you... then I moved. So I moved, I went to India. <laughs> the, 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 cricket. the cricket thing, not yes. to find, not so to, you, not to find, you, not to find myself. You were one. solvent though, as a result of doing Ballymore. So you could do, you could go off on an adventure. Yeah, and I, I needed to be solvent because otherwise, when I when I rang the England and Wales Cricket Board to tell them that I am the BBC Cric- Scotland cricket correspondent, please come. I have you know be involved in the press party and uh, travel and accreditation. One of the things they said was, uh, of course, yeah, absolutely fine. Uh, do we just send the bill to BBC Scotland? Yes. And I went, no, no, don't. <laughs> Rather complicated accounting system. It needs to come through me. I work, you know. Um, so yeah, and I moved to. I got an a- acting agent and I moved to to London. Mm. Uh, and she'd said, you know, the way it works is you need to make sure that you can afford to come here and not work for six months. Right, yeah. Gosh. Um, and so I did that. I, I lived in a flat in North London with um, my friend Dougie Anderson, who, we had a, who I'd met doing, like, tea in the park coverage or something. Yeah. It was brilliant. Yeah, and, and I, it was just, yeah, it was a lot of fun, but I mean, nothing was happening. Where I was, I was like, well, I've got an acting agent now, so... So, come on, come on. I wonder if it's, it's probably not plugged in, is it? <laughs> or maybe I wonder if maybe they've lost all of the numbers or whatever. And it just was very, very quiet. And I, but I, I, I convinced myself that I was making a living right. doing stand-up, but I, I wasn't. Oh. I just wasn't doing any. Okay. And then, 
and then you know you sort of but you'd get like Balamori money or whatever and then yeah. after a while you're like then that then they stop showing it and then you're like actually I don't I don't do anything do I I do <laughs> it's nothing. I just sort of watch box sets <laughs> nothing happens and so then I sort of started doing stand up again in, in 2007 I guess and then it was just a sort of slow I did a Edinburgh Festival show 2007 yeah. 2008 2009 I'd go out sort of be on the circuit you'd get and then you just kind of keep keep do, doing that really just tr trying to get good at that and we I got married and we'd had a, our first child in 2009 so you're like then I need you know and so I just yeah. I sort of went out and did that and I suppose tried to get better at, at doing that and then um, yeah I got uh, Rev and, um, and then the phone started ringing a bit you did Rev and then later yeah well the I also needed I was pretty uncastable as a younger man really I wasn't you know I'm sure I've said this before in things, but you'd like if you were reading a script and it says a completely normal 28 year old walks into the room, I'd think, well, I'm not going to get this, am I? <laughs> Whereas when like part in Rev yes. was written for someone who was in their mid 50s or yes. whatever, yes, but I could play it because I'm odd. Um, and, and then and then and then the sort of and I'd done an episode of The Thick of It just before then. That was right. that was useful. But then I did the show of about the Indian experience yes. around then as well on an episode of McIntyre's Roadshow. And these things happened in 2010, so it was quite a year when various things... And, and, and then happening. the panel shows, and you become part of that... Uh, coterie. Coterie, or what was I going to say? Clique? Um, Mafia? No, I, I can't remember what I was going to say. The thing for stars, Firmament. Firmament. The firmament, part of that Firmament, and this is the point at which people know you. So we'll skip through all of that. Although we should add that Fibber in the Heat was nominated for the William Hill Sportsbook of the Year, so you can write as well as... Oh, as well as the other stuff. Yeah, I was genuinely very. I bet it's a lovely excited honor, by that. Yes. Yeah, because of one of my favourite cricket books. I was a lot of hard yakka, uh, Simon Hughes, and that on the front it was like winner, I think, of that, and that's how I first knew of that thing. But also when I so there was a sort of nominees kind of drinks party somewhere in Piccadilly where they, yeah. and uh, it was hosted by John Inverdale, and he read there was five or six books nominated, and he ran through all of them. And one of them was written by Tyler Strong and was about being a whistleblower in the Tour de France yes, and the whole world of drugging and cycling. Yes. And he went through all the books in a very nice way. And he went, and there's this book, which is, uh, shines a light in a squash that we've not heard of before. And this extraordinary story about this football manager, uh, Miles Jupp, has written a very funny book about the India. And uh, here is a book that really has changed the face of a sport forever. And you think, oh, I'm still in this. I'm still in this. <laughs> tearing, yeah. tearing up your betting slip at this Yeah, point. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that one came I wonder up. who it will be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost want sound effects to kick in yeah, at that yeah. point. Going, da, da, da. Um, which brings us to the to, to, to the new show, which the room, gonna... with, the room with the le the least jeopardy in us possible. Yeah, <laughs> uh, miles up on I bang. It's uh, it's it's a very arresting press release where, where where it says it's a new show, his first in seven years, detailing how he survived the brain tumor. Yeah. That is, that is the that's the 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 story that is the the or the the spine of the show. Yeah, it's a sort of piece of storytelling, really a bit like Fibber was. Yeah, that mm. um, I was working in London by uh, filming here, by just by chance, mm. August twenty twenty one, and I I just come here for the day. And I was filming something, and I just suddenly got a flashing in my eye, and the people carry on the way back to where all the trailers are. And I, out of nowhere, no clues, or whatever I've been doing, like I've been on holiday the week before, the week before that, I've been doing this thing. Um, uh, why didn't they ask Evans with Hugh Laurie? And yeah. like, have been like, oh, this is, you know, life just seemed sort of glorious. And then I was in this kind of this sort of flashing, and um, and after a while, I thought, no, something's very badly wrong here. And by the time I got out of the car, I could barely sort of stand up. And uh, was a, a, a runner was going, you really dizzy, let me get your chair. Right. And he ran off to get more help. And I just, it was just sort of like this explosion, really, like glass shattering. And then I came round in, um, I came round once being held, people holding him in the recovery position. And a lady saying, can you tell me your wife's name and her number? I then came around again in an ambulance, and then you and then you're sort of stabilised there. You spend quite a lot of time, I think, in the ambulance before it sets off again. Um, of course, there'll be a queue anyway when they get there, so I might as well sort you out where they are. Uh, but that and that was quite that. That's sort of where you really realise things have happened to you. Although it's a sort of foggy, you're like, mm. oh yes, and you're like, you're answering questions, and they're you know they're trying to get to the bottom of 
what it is. You know, a paramedic sort of turn up and take charge in a situation like that. You have no mm. idea why someone's doing that. And then, I don't know, you're in a back of an ambulance with someone unconscious waiting for them to come. You know, you can't until they don't come out. You know, it's yes. incredible, really. Uh, and then I was taken to the, we were quite near the West Middlesex Hospital. And then eventually, you know, they go and have a scan and they come back and say there's something there that shouldn't be there. Um, was your wife with you by this point? She no, she was. We she was at home with still in Wales. Our five children. Yeah, um, and it's also it's in the pandemic as well, so oh you can't God, just course, yeah, you can't just wander around. No. Um, I mean, the security in those days was almost as tight as it is at Global Radio. Um, <laughs> it was glad very, they let you in. A lot of doors, James. A lot <laughs> of doors. Um, uh, but the. They, they, what I had it turned out was something called a meningioma. I'm thinking, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And they are they are generally benign. Yes. And this was this was benign. Uh, it's between the lining of the skull and the brain itself. So in neurosurgery terms, it's accessible. Yeah. And, and you, you, you and I would struggle. Sure. But, but if you've had the, you know, if you've been, a, you know, if you've got the right. Yes. But you must have feared the worst. Or did you not have time to fear the worst? Really? No, no, I definitely had time to. You would sort of drift in and out of consciousness a bit, but so you'd have, I'd get good news and bad news. So they'd go, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, you've had a seizure. We found out what the cause was. Oh, great. The cause is there's a sort of growth in there. <laughs> oh, no. Right. Okay. Okay. It looks benign. Right. But might not be. So let's have a look. Sheesh. Okay. Or, um, okay. Yeah, we've done an MRI. It is benign. However, it might be something that was caused. There might be another tumor somewhere else, and this is an offshoot of it. Right. So, so there'd be a, God, you know, a lot exhausting of exhausting just just listening. It is to, a bit. Yes. It, well, yeah. There was a bit when I there was a bit when I was moved to a room on my own, right. and I remember thinking, oh, and that was when I was waiting to find out what it was. So I right. did. There, yeah, you are lying in bed thinking, have I got brain cancer? Yes. And then the door opens again, and you and you haven't. Gosh. You know, uh, which is where you know that's. Um, that's a fork in the road, and I, not oh. everyone's. No, you're right. Of course. Story goes down that route, so you ha you know it is. So how soon after the first after the seizure did you have neurosurgery? Three, three weeks, something like that. They yeah. said, "Look, go home." You, also, the the swelling, all the hmm. steroids take a lot of that out. Uh, so they said, "Go home," um, and you know, hope it could be a month. It could be three months. Okay. They actually also said it's not urgent the surgery now right. because the thing that was going to happen has happened. In a way, it does need it does need to, you need to have it. Mm. And then I then I as it happened, it was about three weeks. It's quite a risky procedure, presumably, even though well it they was a they tell you the, the the risks. You have to sign forms, like and stuff like that. Yeah, because of course it doesn't. No. They but, say, look, there's a 5% chance of you not being able to use the left-hand side of your body again, and there's a 2% chance of you dying. And those, you know, you think, well, those odds are in my favour. Well, if you do 50 operations a month, you yeah. know, you've seen a lot of really bad stuff, haven't you? Yeah. So, but the maths is in your in your favour. But also, it's a kind of situation where you're like, you know, you know those people sort of really sort of up on their health and are like, well, I rang my doctor and said I've been reading this or whatever. You think they... I mean, what can I bring to this yeah, discussion? Yeah, yeah. So just yeah. <laughs> here I am. Tell me what I need to do. I'm not going to. I might have questions, but they're not going to be. Well, it doesn't sound like that's not how I'd do it. You know. <laughs> so you're kind of you just go and then it, so that felt quite relaxing. Yes. Okay. Yes. In a way, just in the terms of like this is, and I said to my surgeon just before the op, I'd spoken to them a lot prior to it, and he said, "How?" I said, "I'm." He said, "How do you feel?" I said, "I'm, I'm in the right place," and he went. Mm. Yeah, we've done a lot of these. That's nice. And it was great, yeah. So, and then, and, but also just the, you know, it's in COVID. I'm in a ward, there's maybe six people on my ward. We're all in the same, all in the same situation. Um, and you just got, you're just surrounded by people who just look after other people uh, and, uh, all all day. You know, it's quite overwhelming, that bit. I, I, I came out yes, of hospital yes, quite okay. upbeat because I'd just been immersed. In the best of us. Yeah, for you know, you've had seventy-two hours in a situation where people are just doing everything. Yeah, you yeah. know, and it was kind of like a holiday. You are, you are also full of drugs. <laughs> yes, but, of yes. But, you are, but 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 you're like these people are, you know. Yeah. You know, you make a noise at two o'clock in the morning, and someone's there immediately saying, "You are you all right?" You, you know, it was. Gosh. Yeah. So that that side of it, I found genuinely uplifting. I can see why. My, I mean, my surgeon, I saw him. He didn't, you know, 
speaking about the conditions that he works and I saw a clip of him on the news agents mm. talking about it you know and that, that was my that was one story. of my surgeons yeah. you know they they these people they they work in extraordinary situations and I but so yeah it was a kind of incredible experience to go through really and I'm you know I'm very lucky but it's also then a thing like when you tell people like well, what was it what's yeah. that like and we, so I kind of written a thing we, about we, what it's like. You've, and what it's, was, you've just you've just second guessed my final right. question, really, which would have been: At what point did you think that this is this could be a show? Because it's not the most obvious. But then actually, it is because people want to know what it's like, and you are yeah. a, a funny storyteller, and therefore the two. Well, match hopefully, quite yeah. Nicely. It's, well, it's partly about. So you know, you sit sure. down. To, you know, if you're promoting a stand-up tour. People often say, "What's it about?" Yes. And normally, I go, "Oh, it's about uh, those little things that annoy us all." Or, uh, "Oh, it's about uh, it's about uh, the big picture, really." Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not. It's not about anything. It's about it's about yeah, it's about stuff. Yeah. Uh, whereas it's no, it's telling a telling a telling a story. And it, it, you know, if you go through a really stressful, you know, a stressful incident in a cafe can be quite a funny thing. So, like yes. a massively stressful thing can be. I don't know what it's not. It's not tragedy plus time or whatever. It's can. You know, it's pressure and fear and all of those things. You know, it's a big old maelstrom of stuff. And, of course, like, funny stuff emerges from that. And, and you know, you'd tell people about things and there would be things about it that you'd sort of find funny or darkly funny. But also, you know, there's a sort of lot of joy to be had in an experience. Yes. In an experience like this. You know. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, can, I, I get that. Because you would come in and you want to make it palatable for your... You know, if your children say, what's it like, you yeah. know, having brain surgery, you don't go... It's the single most terrifying experience I've ever been through. <laughs> you go, well, I tell you what happened that was quite funny, and then and you know, and there and there's it, and so yes. I kind of think, you know, and also because it's about me having brain surgery, the person that's telling the story, yeah. you know how it ends because I'm I'm here, yeah. so there's not a kind of I'm not walking on again. Let me just tell you what happened to a friend of mine. There's no jeopardy. So you're like, you know. Unless you were really like, oh, God, I wasn't expecting him to survive. <laughs> At the end. Spoiler yeah. alert. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm alive. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, in, in that way, it works a bit like the way Titanic does. <laughs> uh, you, but, 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 but also at the same time, nothing like that. <laughs> um, you, you can find out how to get tickets and find out more uh, uh, about the new show at milesjup.co.uk. Miles Jup on I bang, it's called. I usually end, and I've got no idea what your answer to this question will be. You don't, I, I sense your career hasn't involved. It's the question, would you sing for us? No, yes, it is. It <laughs> is. <laughs> no. Uh, you haven't ticked boxes in your career. It's it, 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 You've kind of had quite a pleasant uh time of it but is there things that you would call ambitions are there things because you, you've done a hollywood movie haven't you you've done a west end show is there anything left on that list of things that you'd quite like to tick off um i have you know i have had periods where i've been doing absolutely nothing for mm. like long periods and i've had periods where things have been really exciting i in turn you know i i've kind of I've, i think i have worked with all of the people that made me want to do this and in a way that's you know when I'd so Hugh Laurie who you interviewed on this yes. show when I did his thing that was I've always, I've always loved him and the, and the work he did with Stephen Fry being, yeah he? yeah he he's, he's just yeah, that, and there's a lot of and he really brilliant director just fantastic yes. for me and I, I think it was quite a difficult shoot for him for a number of reasons but he was so fantastic with us and it was lovely and I, when I finished that, I said to my agent, "That was great. I'm, I could happily retire now. That was just great." And she went, "No, no, no. You've got five children don't, for don't, a start. It's don't stuff. do something really good and use, use that to. Yes, you know. I see. Can I explain the principle of momentum yes, to you? Essentially, yes. and um, but I, I, you know, I just really, I, I mean, I, I, I like it. I have people to provide for, but part of providing, you know, I just want to spend time with them. You know, so I kind of. Uh, the, I mean, this well, the touring thing is sort of great because you can say, I don't want to do weekends, I don't want to do half terms, mm -hmm. I don't want to do holidays. Um, and, and but I, I yeah, I, I don't, I don't really, I, I do want to keep doing it. And and then and you know when things come along and whatever and it, you know, it'd be nice to have an idea and be the sort of person that could then get something made. Yes, I can have an idea and write it and go and tour it myself. I can do that. I can't green light a film. I can't green light a series. 
occasionally I get the opportunity to be in one and so usually if it works out then I would then I would take that opportunity but I'm not you know it would be quite nice to be a sort of Sunday night detective but I don't need to do that for maybe 15 years yeah. would be yeah that would be all right I look forward to that so I don't but yeah no I'm I'm not I think just just Rob Bryden asked me a similar question he said I mean you just want to do more of the same don't you and I and I said no I'd like to do less but better <laughs> and I think that is yeah that's still my ambition yeah Miles Jupp thank you thank you